My name is Ben Greenfield, and on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Life Podcast. But we believe the mechanism for damage from EMFs is because it catalyzes the release of calcium inside the cell. Because the levels of calcium outside the cell are 50,000 times higher, 50,000 times higher. So when it goes into the cell, it's a powerful signaling molecule. What does a signal cell do? It tells cells what some of the things are. It increases the uh, release of superoxide and also nitric oxide. And those are two molecules that they get even close to each other. They instantaneously, I mean, instantaneously form some, this reactive nitrogen species called a uh, pair oxynitride. And that is really, really damaging, probably collectively more, far more damaging than hydroxyl free radical. This hydroxyl radical only lasts about a billionth of a second. Hmm. This pair oxynitride lasts a thousand times longer, so long that it can actually migrate outside of the mitochondria, outside of that cell, and go into another cell in the mitochondria and wow. hang around that long. Faith, family, fitness, health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and a whole lot more. Welcome to the show. All right, folks, in today's episode, which I recorded for you on site with the great Dr. Joe Mercola down in Florida. Uh, we had a wide ranging discussion on everything from the dangers of vegetable oil to intermittent hypoxic training to how this dude's beating young bucks and arm wrestling and a whole lot more. Dr. Joe first joined me on two episodes that I'll link to in the show notes. If you go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash Mercola three, it's bengreenfieldlife.com slash Mercola, the number three. We had one episode on killing fat cells and fixing mitochondria and growing superfoods. We had another one on EMFs and cell phone radiation and protecting yourselves from EMF exposure, even though we give you an updated how-to on that in today's show. Dr. Mercola, is, he goes way back. He's a doctor of osteopathic medicine with a real holistic approach. He's uh, somewhat controversial, uh, as you'll learn about in the first 10 to 15 minutes or so of today's episode. But for the longest time, you know, as a board-certified family physician, he practiced medicine, and he's written contributions and extensive experience uh, in, in patient care. He was granted fellowship status by the American College of Nutrition, He's a best-selling author. Uh, he has everything from books about uh, COVID-19 to the no-grain diet to the bird flu hoax to effortless healing, uh, a whole bunch of different titles. He has a huge background in health, wellness, and technology, runs the very popular website you may have come across before called Mercola.com, has multiple awards. I mean, I'm, I'm at his house and he just has <laughs> plaques and awards all over the wall for all of the work that he's done in medicine and health and beyond. And uh, he just tirelessly works to disseminate important health information around the world, which sometimes turns him into a lightning rod and also earns him a lot of numerous awards and honors. And he's a very interesting guy. You're about to learn if you've never heard him chatting before. So anyways, sit back or walk or lift or whatever it is you're doing right now and get ready for a great episode with Dr. Joseph Mercola. All right. We did it. That was a fun little setup. Open the kimono for folks. Uh, Joe and I decided to try and do an entire podcast with no tech crew. No videographer, no scheduling, just lounging on the couch with our shirts peeled off. That's this right. This might be the first shirtless episode, dual shirtless episode that I've done in quite some time. Yeah, yeah it reminds me, when, the last time I was with you personally was when we were at Mindshare yeah. in uh, Arizona, uh, Phoenix, or yeah. somewhere. And uh, we went to a lunch and we just decided, okay, this is going to be a shirtless table. We started a trend. I remember that. We were the vitamin D table. Well, you're, you've always been big. Yeah on vitamin D. And by the way, I should get this out of the way before we even start. If you guys want the show notes, I'll put them at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Mercola3. That's Mercola the number three, because Joe, this is the third time all right. that I've interviewed you. We did an interview on all, all sorts of things. I remember we talked a little bit about, about vitamin D, and then we had a whole interview about EMF, EMF and I, I would love to revisit that a little bit today as it pertains to linoleic acid particularly, not to scare people away with big words too early in the show. Uh, and then uh, you know, today I've returned to your compound in Florida. And yes, uh, you, you have quite the lifestyle down here that includes plenty of shirtlessness. And you, you, you've always been pretty big on vitamin D. I mean, you got a plaque on the wall over there about you being the 
sunshine doctors. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, for the, the, this entire century, right? So it's long before COVID nineteen. Yes. Actually, my my passion about vitamin D is is somewhat what precipitated some of the challenges that I have by mainstream media. Because since we last connected, I've had the honor of being named the number one spreader of COVID misinformation in 2021. That's better than being named the number one spreader of COVID. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, by the White House <laughs> and you know, Biden and the Jeez. head of the National Institutes of Health. So it was this the best honor I've ever gotten. In my Did life. you get a plaque or a trophy? Or no, I'm wait. Well, I actually my mask is in like a gold, <laughs> gold plate of mask. <laughs> Did not get that, but yeah, so it, it, they, partially that was precipitated by the, the, the influence I built up over a quarter century of having the website, but also my passion about vitamin D. And I actually have written uh, my first peer-reviewed article this century, uh, really? published in Nutrients, which is a pretty high-impact nut uh, nutrition journal. And this might happen to people who are, who are watching or listening to this podcast. Like, if you click through to your website from, say, like, Twitter or some other sites, it will say you're about to enter an unsafe website. Yeah, There's phishing site. Disinformation or phishing. Is that, is that why? Yeah, that's the other side. Another mechanism. No, that's, no, that they're doing that. They're putting these warnings up there to, to make the public believe that I'm a, an uncredible, discredible, uncredible source. In, incredible source. Incredible. I like incredible. <laughs> that's the best way to think about it. So when something like that happens, I'm just curious, you know, you, you don't have to spill all the business secrets on the podcast, but does that have a pretty big impact on site visitors, on business? On, yeah, it did. Um, it, it, it's actually that like exposure. Yeah, yeah. It definitely helped us in many ways because we had been essentially buried for the most part in, this, in the Google algorithms. And all the exposure brought my book, The Truth About COVID-19, to number one. And it was my best-selling book ever. Could you actually buy that book on Amazon? Oh, yeah, yeah, you could. They never took it off. Oh. So it was number one on USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly. You know, I read that book when it first came out. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, but obviously pretty controversial. Well, and, and that was two years, well, over two years ago now. And, uh, you know, it was highly controversial. And people claim me of lying through the book. But, you know, two years later, nothing's been disproven. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we could obviously go down the code, right? Well, yeah, we know we need to know. Blue in the face, but back to the vitamin D piece, which got us on this thread. So was your argument that there's a specific impact of vitamin D on the immune system? That would, yeah, that's that my review paper that was published in Nutrients yeah. suggested that. By, by the way, the reason I asked this question is just a few days ago, one of our mutual friends, Georgia Dinkoff, or he's, mm -hmm. he's more of a friend of yours, I probably was not bad on a podcast yet, but he published an article showing that about 4,000, 10,000 international units day, vitamin D was one of the best things you could do to both prevent and survive GI cancer. Yes, I'm, dealing with, I'm dealing with a cancer in the family right now, and I immediately sent that off to my family member because that's a, it's a very cheap and readily available supplement. Mm -hmm. It's also available via the sunshine. But you, you, you were originally doing your research on it related to the immune system? Well, you know, I don't do lab research, but, it, you know, basically like you investigate a journalist that yeah. goes and compiles information and, and interviews the world-class experts. I've interviewed almost every world-class researcher on vitamin D wow. over the years. And that one of the fundamental benefits it has is it radically reduces not just colon cancer, which is well documented for, but pretty much all types of cancers. It's very positive at pre preventing and, and treating cancers. Very similar to linoleic acid is the exact, being the exact converse in yeah. increasing the risk of every, every yeah. cancer. Yeah, you walk around with your shirt off a lot when I'm alone. You sure was walking on the beach yesterday. I know you're, you're a big sunshine hunter. Would you say that's the best way to get vitamin D or do you supplement with it also? I haven't taken a swallow of vitamin D supplement over 15 years. Really? Yeah, and yet my vitamin D levels are consistently over 100 nanograms per milliliter. 100? 100. No, without what's, swallowing. What's, what's your response to the people who are like, oh, it's going to cause calcification if you have too much vitamin D? Is, is that is that an, an, it's a, not true a, a myth or is there any truth behind that? Or why do people say that? Well, it, it, you have to be very, very careful when you swallow vitamin D orally. So this is oral supplementation. Oral supplementation. Because there's no feedback yeah. going on. So, and there's, you know, a lot of the research that was published initially suggested that there, there was all these different, they correlate all these benefits to vitamin D. But most of, most of the research that wasn't, it wasn't being that the vitamin D level, people were taking vitamin D supplements. So almost all the elevated or 
vitamin D levels are related to sun exposure merely. So it's, it's really served as a biomarker for sun exposure because there's other benefits other than ultraviolet B radiation, which only comprises about 4% of the spectrum of sunlight. The, and that's the, the specific wavelength and frequency that causes your body to convert 7-deoxy cholesterol to, to vitamin D. Uh, now, is it true that there are certain genetic factors that might limit that conversion from occurring? Because I've seen people like... Uh, sure, there are. Uh, Kashi Kong from the DNA company. He's talked yeah, about that before sure, on my yeah, podcast yeah. about how some people like that, might have yeah. a higher need for oral supplementation. Yeah, and if there could be... More typically with the SNFs, there's it's the vitamin D receptors. Mm -hmm. But there are other variables that you can do that make a big difference. One of them is vitamin K2. Okay. And then the other would be magnesium. Yeah. So a lot of people who, who aren't taking enough magnesium, once they add it, then, then their vitamin D levels tend to normalize. Now, the, the form of vitamin D, as a matter of fact, I was just texting last time with another guy. I'm interested in having him on the show. I haven't yet. Dr. Tyler Panzer, who does a lot related to genetic SNPs. I think he might do a little bit of work with uh, Joe Cohen for self decode, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Uh, he says that there's a form of oral vitamin D. Joe Cohen was at our table in Mastermind. That's right. That's yeah. right. He was also there. A colocalciferol as an oral form that's more expensive but much more bioavailable. And he increases think, vitamin D levels within just a couple of weeks. I think that's the other term for vitamin D is colocalciferol. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you supplement with it, I believe a lot of times it's, it's a, a hydroxy vitamin D form that's less bioavailable than this colocalciferol. I could only find one company. Uh, I forget the name of it. If I can hunt it down and put it in the show notes, I will, that actually uses this colocalciferol form. The reason this is interesting for me is because, according to Dr. Kahn, I have that SNP that would limit vitamin D conversion from sunlight, which makes sense because when I used to wear this iron, I was out in the sun sometimes eight to hours a day, mm -hmm. and I tested the levels were 30 to 40. Mm -hmm. and so now I do supplement, you know, I take around 2,000 units a day or so, and my levels are typically in the 70s to 90s. Yeah, so yeah. The, the hundreds a year. Yeah, I would, I would suggest a slight modification of that. Uh, in fact, I was just updating my script for my new master class in composing this, which is a uh, designed to empower people with the resources they're needed to, to survive the next coming crisis, I believe, which will be here at some point, in not too distant future. But if the, the, when the, the, the module was on sun exposure, and then when you're seeking to optimize your vitamin D levels, if you don't have access all the time, of course, you're going to need an oral supplement. But on the days that you do get out there, don't take your vitamin D supplement. You're yeah. already getting it from the sun. That's yeah. a, that you're going to overdo. Even if you have that genetic issue with the well, conversion? I'm not convinced of that because you're getting a pretty high level. The 2,000 is not the normal dose for oral, for oral D supplementation for most people. Mm -hmm. It's usually closer to 8,000. Yes. Yeah. typical yeah. adult requires. Yeah. So for some people, I, I know some functional medicine docs who will prescribe like a vitamin D bomb, like a 50,000 units of intramuscular. Don't, not recommended at all. Yeah, sometimes. Not recommended. Yeah. yeah. Why do yeah. you recommend an approach like that? Well, because it's, it, that what you're, you're inferring or implied is it's a... Uh, a parenteral intramuscular injection, and the, the only way that's done is typically through vitamin D2, which is okay. you know, a, a, a plant-based version, not as healthy. Okay. Though Michael Hollick, who is probably the premier vitamin D researcher, is fond of it, most of the others are not. Is there anything to be said for that, that uh, strategy some people use, especially plant-based diet enthusiasts, who put mushrooms out in the sunlight to harness oh, yeah, that, and, that, and that, concentrate that, vitamin D in mushrooms? I mean, it doesn't concentrate, it actually converts it. It converts okay. it converts so to like steroids. Yes, but it doesn't make vitamin D3. Humans make vitamin D3. Animals make vitamin D3. When you irradiate lanolin, which is the primary, almost exclusive uh, raw material used to create vitamin D supplements. You mean lanolin from sheep? Yes. Okay. That's how they create vitamin D. It's they irradiate uh, lanolin with UVB. So it can be, and that creates vitamin D3. When you make it from um, mushrooms, you create vitamin D2. Okay. Which is, I think, called ergocalciferol. But if, yeah, if you take ergocalciferol or D2, you can still elevate your, your D level somewhat, though, right? There is some benefit to it because yeah. there's a cross reactivity in the receptors, for sure. Yeah. But it's not as good as D3. It yeah. really isn't. It's, it's fast and inferior. 
I grew pink oyster mushrooms all last year. I have little rye blocks out in the forest and I grow them and I take them just to put them out on the picnic table off the patio, yeah. leave them out in the sun all day. And those yeah. things are like they're like vegan bacon basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Sure. So so the um the the crisis that you just referred to, I don't want to necessarily allow you to drop that and leave it behind. Are you talking about an economic crisis or Everything. something else? Well, very similar to what we have with COVID, it's so much worse. Lockdowns, suppression, personal freedoms loss, you know, just tyrannical oppression by the government of the authority, authoritarian control over loss of personal freedoms. Would there be a trigger for that, like another pandemic or something like that? Yeah, there's going to be some ostensible trigger. Uh, or I mean, it could be a false flag, like yeah. what they did with 9-11. Uh, but something will trigger it. could be losing the grid. could be another clearly infectious pandemic that, that is high on the likelihood. Uh, but, you know, they've, they've kind of, well, really, I mean, they're, 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 this was just a trial run, you know. I mean, they've been getting worse yeah. and worse every every two or three years. They've launched to make it, you know, they try their tricks. And they've gotten more sophisticated and smarter with time, of course. Yeah. So it's no surprise. I mean, like, I feel like I'm a little bit more of a prepper on paper than you are out in the forest and you're building a farm in Idaho with water cisterns and off grid and everything. Well, you're, I haven't, I haven't showed you. beach in Florida. So well, I, I have not shown you everything yet. Right. Well, maybe I haven't seen the bunker, but I got to ask you, like, you know, you're doing an entire master class. I think you said it was 50 plus modules and hours and hours of content, but. You know, yeah, without, yeah. without having to do the entire master class right here on the podcast, so there are a few key things that, right, yeah. that you think people should do to prepare for something like this? Yeah, what we just talked about, exposure to the sun rather than swelling vitamin D supplements, because there's so many other benefits, you know, that being exposed to the sun would be. Two primary ones, when it increases the production of melatonin, not in your pineal gland, but in the subcellular spaces in your mitochondria where it's absolutely needed because that's where most all the reactive oxygen species are generated in energy production. I thought bright light suppressed melatonin. In the pineal gland. Okay. Not in the subcellular mitochondrial space. Interesting. In the mitochondria. So, and that's where you need my melatonin. So if you have elevated levels of melatonin, this is my Russell writer, who's the, the primary researcher. Yeah, yeah, he, he knows a lot about mitochondria. Yeah, but we are saying is, papers. Is if sunlight is elevating mitochondria, uh, Mito uh, mel mel melatonin, yes, during the day, there yes. would not be a sleepiness-inducing effect, and it would instead just allow for the anti-inflammatory effect of melatonin on the cell membrane. Anti more antioxidant than okay. anti-inflammatory. Uh, yes. And that's what happens. Yeah, this is why even if you can't get that, because many people are unable to get sun exposure in, in the winter and almost everywhere in the United States, then you can do, there's other strategies because it's the near infrared frequency that generates that. So you can do a near infrared, oh. not far, because far won't cause that, that to occur. If it's yeah. one of those saunas that's a combination of near infrared and far infrared, do you think that suffices? Because some people say that, that the angle of the photons from the far infrared will negate some of the effects of the near infrared. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think I, 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 I've not seen literature to support that. I suspect there would be a benefit if you had a sufficient reach a sufficient threshold of near infrared exposure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, some people would hear you say, "Well, there's going to be a crisis to get out of the sun." Like it sounds kind of silly. Yeah. So, so the reason behind that would be to prepare your immune system to better prepare your, your overall resilience, health okay. resilience. Because it, if you're not healthy, look what happened if you weren't healthy in COVID. Yeah, sure. That's true. A lot of people die. Yeah. So the, the, the healthier you are, the more you'll be able to be resilient. So I think that's probably one of the most foundational things is to get sun exposure. And it's virtually been eliminated from our consciousness in, in the culture. And actually, the, the exact converse has been embedded in it because almost all the dermatologists are warning people that the sun causes cancer. Well, you know what, Ben? Yeah. The I, sun does not I cause cancer. It just got published that I think the title of the book is Get the F Out of the Sun. Yeah. And it's literally just about the how. You know, this, this idea that a lot of, of health freaks have championed that sunscreen is full of carcinogens and that the impact of sunscreen is more deleterious than exposure to sunlight is something that, that is leading down, leading a lot of people down the road getting skin cancer from sun exposure. Is there, is there, is there anything to be said for the no. dangerous potential of sunlight when it comes to excess radiation like UVA or Well, sure. It, there's no question that you never want to get sunburned. That would be foolish. But you, the, you really need to explore the fundamental reasons why sun exposure would cause cancer. Why would it trigger cancer? Okay. It's because of the other most important strategy, which we alluded to earlier, which is linoleic acid, 
which is ostensibly an essential fat, and I can make it stronger. And Explain wider. that to people in lake acid. What, the what lake is, acid is... And by the way, that's different because there's, there's also alpha... Linolenic. Linolenic acid, yeah, which, which is, is like uh, uh, less of a polyunsaturated fat. No, 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 it's actually more. It's more polyunsaturated, but... It's omega-3. It's, I mean, at least... At least well, I, little, little Laic has two double bonds. Mm -hmm. I think maybe linolenic has two double bonds. It probably has two. I think alpha linoleic has, has more double bonds than linoleic acid, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Most of the omega-3s are typically... Less better. damaging. ALA is less of a problem than linoleic acid. Well, ostensibly, they, they, they stated because it's omega-3, alpha linoleic. Yeah. Whereas linoleic, which is 80% of the omega-6 fats. When you're talking about omega-6 fats, you're almost always referring to linoleic acid. Okay. So, uh, but it's, it's an excess of this. In, in the right quantities, the quantities that were essentially in every human on this planet prior to the Civil War, it will, you, you will not get skin cancer if you had that level of linoleic acid in your tissue. Low it, levels of linoleic acid. Yeah, like okay. 2%. Okay. The average person today has 12%. Can you measure that? Yeah, you can. Absolutely. Oh, really? Is that, is that, that uh, what is it called, the omega quant or the omega index? Well, that will give you, it will give you a barometer. It's not so much omega quant. You have to do like a fatty acid profile. Okay. But the op op optimal way would be a tissue fat biopsy, which isn't okay. that hard. You know, okay. It's better than muscle biopsy. For All right. So, so let's say people aren't going to get the biopsy. I guess the, the biggest elephant in the room here is when you use the term like linoleic acid, and the fact that high concentrations of it would increase the possibility for damage in response to sun exposure. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the primary sources of linoleic acid in the modern American diet? Well, the, the primary one is processed foods. And, you know, two, I think it was like two thirds of the calories in America, the American foods are from processed foods. So in, in the primary culprit there is of course industrially processed seed oils, which which started around the American Civil War. Okay. And they didn't. And that's why you said the Civil War, because that's when seed oil processing began to right. increase. Okay. Absolutely. And it didn't become popular until the 20th century. What was it about the Civil War that caused that to happen? No, it was just in, in industrialization. Okay. And we developed the technology to do it. We didn't previously never had it. Yeah. And, and in the 19th century, 99% of the fat that we consumed, 99% came from animal sources. No linoleic acid. Really? Yes. yes. And today, about 70%, maybe, maybe it's either, I, I, it's been a while since I looked at the data, it's either 70 to 90% of the fat that Americans consume is from seed oils. Wow. Totally flipped. Wow. Now, now, prior to that flip, what about some of these oils? I don't, I don't know if, if these would have a certain concentration of linoleic acid, but like extra virgin olive oil. Oh, yeah. Well, those, oil, those, 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 those are minor oils. ones. That's, that's typically the question that most people have. It's because, uh, you know, they're ostensibly viewed as healthy oils, Mediterranean diet and such. Uh, if you had a healthy variety, and the, the range is like from 3 to 20% of, of an olive oil can be linoleic acid, the lower the better, of course. 3% okay. is pretty darn safe. The problem with it has been, and this is also what I'm saying for olive oil is also true for avocado oil, is that 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of the commercial oils, avocado and olive, are adulterated. What yeah, are they adulterated I've with? heard that before. They're and adulterated with the olive oil hunter. Yeah. He, he exposed that on my podcast. Yeah. I was shocked. Yeah, no, no, that's, well, I mean, he may have, I'm sure he did expose it, but it was exposed many, many years yeah. ago. Yeah. I mean, 60 minutes. Did, yeah, 60 minutes. Great 60, olive oil hoax, he called yeah, it. 60 yeah. minutes. Did, was saying that I'm well over ten. And avocado oil is similar. Yeah, almost identical. Interesting. Yeah. So, and, and the, the issue is, is that almost everyone, we're, we're probably the rare anomaly, and not that we're just both being shirtless, but we're both very low in little acid. Yeah. Because we've we've known about this and, and consciously avoided it. Yeah. So, oh, for, but for almost me, for me, at least nine years. It's, yeah, yeah. It's been and it, ruthlessly eliminated from my diet. Yeah. So that, that, that and, and why is it so important? Because these seed oils are getting better in cell membranes, and they, they don't they have a very low turnover rate. They, they're they're virtually they're not preferentially oxidized as fuel at all. They are stored in your tissue. Where saturated fat would be burned much quicker than a, than a PUFA, polyunsaturated fats. Yeah. So um, it takes. If you're really, really diligent and hyper obsessive compulsive but avoiding them, you can lower it to almost to normal levels in about three years. That's about the earliest. 
Otherwise, it's closer. That, that long, if you've been following a standard if, processed food diet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and it could be longer. I, mean, I think five years would probably be safer for most people, maybe in six or seven. What so, is it about the combination of that and sunlight that would make sunlight more dangerous? Well, it essentially soars, serves as the primary source of oxidative stress in your body. Okay. Uh, because of these highly perishable, or these bonds that are highly susceptible to oxidative damage. You know, just one lake acid is too simple for dull bonds. When it's exposed to free radicals in your body, which are normal, they're normal signaling molecules, typically generated in the mitochondria, things like superoxide dismutase and uh, even nitric oxide, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl free radicals, they damage those free, those those double bonds and they convert it to something called an oxalam, which is an oxidative linoleic acid metabolite. What do you call them? Oxalam? Oxalam. Oxalam. Okay. Oh, oxidative linoleic acid metabolite. Okay. Oxalam. And linoleic which are primarily... acid metabolite. Yeah. They're primarily reactive aldehydes, things like melodialdehyde. Yeah. Uh, for hydroxymononol, glyoxyl. These are a lot of the things that, that some functional medicine docs will test you for. Yeah, that's what they should. You need to do a detox. Yeah, and yeah. what is the, the almost exclusive source of these guys? Linoleic acid. Really? Yeah, exactly. And you know, people are worried about ages, advanced glycation end products, but the primary source of ages are linoleic acid metabolites. Really? 23 Most people would say parts of the combination of sugar with a heated protein. It, and most people would be wrong. I mean, I can show you, the study's been out for 20 years showing huh. this. Yeah. It's not, it's linoleic acid. So I, I'm, I'm sort of dancing around that to answer your original question is why is it contributing to cancer? So these oxalans are the primary reason. It's not because they increase inflammation. There are a lot of people who, who suggest to avoid eating the omega 6s because they increase inflammation because they're because linoleic acids, the next metabolite converts to arachidonic acid, which is a precursor for many pro-inflammatory eicosanoids and prostaglandins, but that's not the mechanism. The mechanism is it increases oxalates. Hmm. And, and these, these oxidations go through the roof and, and essentially destroys your mitochondria prematurely because there's specific fats in your mitochondrial inner membrane, like the cardiolipin, which I'm sure you've heard of, yeah. responsible for forming this real, that curve within the mitochondrial. And that's not the membrane around the cell. It's no, no, the it's, it's, it's the inner membrane around the mitochondria. Yeah, the inner mitochondria. Right, right. And the vast majority of the fat in there, because of the perversion of our diet, is cardiolipid. So, so, the, so the, the, the dietary intake of your fat can influence the type of fats that are on your inner mitochondrial membrane. A hundred percent. can directly yes. impact inner mitochondrial membrane composition. Yeah, and uh, now I told you I wrote this review paper on vitamin D for nutrients. Well, I just had another review paper published just this year, just like two months ago. It was uh, a, a narrative review of linoleic acid damages. And one of the, they're, they're pretty aggressive reviewers now. They had four of the peer reviewers, and one of them was just, gave me the argument that linoleic acid has to be healthy because it's in breast milk. Yeah. So I, I obliterated and destroyed his argument because I found I went back and found a study published in 1950 where they fed uh, this group of people who had like 5% of the women had, no, 5% of the content of the breast milk in these women in the 1950s was, was linoleic acid, which is much below what it is today. Like it's close to, closer to 15% because of the day. women's diet. It's, 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 it's a radical yeah. increase. I mean, that was 75 years ago. So what they did in the experiment, they gave them pure soybean oil or something, was just almost pure linoleic acid, and they doubled it within two weeks. Oh, okay. So they artificially elevated the levels of linoleic acid in the breast milk in the study based on the Yeah, because it's a, just a reflection. You know, his argument was, was totally invalid because that would mean that, oh, the DDT's in the breast milk, that's okay. Right? Yeah. No, no it, just, it just accumulates whatever your body's feeding. It's the same thing with cardiolipin in your mitochondria. And, and I've actually had a dialogue with uh, some high-level... Canadian uh, clinician who is, believes that this isn't true and that because the common belief within conventional science is that 80% of the fatty acids in cardiolipin are linoleic acid. They think that's healthy. 
Is that true? Right. The eighty percent? Yeah, that, that is. They say eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, and and I don't dispute. Now, that. is that because eighty to ninety percent is supposed to be, or no, it's currently it, eighty it, to ninety percent based right. on the modern American diet? Right, because we've been doing this for over a hundred so years. You're saying you could find somebody hundred years ago. There are some. Their mitochondrial membrane it wouldn't have such high levels of. Yeah, like there's that. a measure of your lives. Yours, yours or mine, it's not going to be the time. I wish I'd give them a measure of time. Yeah, you got to get a biopsy. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure the, the methodology and yeah. such from look at yeah. fatty acid concentration, but it's a research. I mean, you're not something you can do a quest lab. But, but surely, if you were to get that omega index score, which is far more common and available, and you were to have a like high omega six index to omega three, it would be a pretty decent clue. Well, it's not so much. You no, know, I would it's disagree. Not, it's not so much the ratio. You really okay. need the absolute value. So there are other tests. I mean, you could do a fatty acid profile through Quester Lab or mm -hmm. there are other companies that provide pretty powerful data like NutriVal. Yeah. NutriVal will give you that, that data yeah. too. Okay, yeah, NutriVal or the metabolic uh, yeah, so, is a test by Genova Diagnostics. It's very similar to the NutriVal. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you do if you were out at a Brazilian steakhouse with a whole food salad bar you know, or, or you actually consume linoleic acid? Because it's not like... I mean, unless you're extremely cautious, you're going to be able to completely avoid it. Is there something you can consume or do afterwards? Yeah, there are foods. You know, ultimately it comes down to the, the food selection that you're having. And, and uh, typically animal foods would be a buyer. Not all animal foods. So, so oh, what I'm saying is what if you eat linoleic acid? Like is this, because I've heard Dr. Oh, no. James and Dean Nicolantonio talk about glycine, or spirulina. I've heard other people talk about maybe well, things the single most charcoal. The, the single most, well, the activated charcoal would be one way because that's going to bind everything yeah. and, and help, help you excrete it. But assuming you wanted to assimilate it, the best thing to do would be take vitamin E. And I think almost every Vitamin E? E, yeah. Interesting. It's a very potent inhibitor of peroxidation of of the fatty acids. Any specific form of vitamin E? Or? Yes, yeah, there's a most, 80 to 90% of vitamin E is pure junk. And it, 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 it probably it could make you worse. Is that so, because, and I had a conversation with Dr. Barry Tan, yeah. from Designs for Health about this. He was championing the idea of a variety of mixed Decopherols yeah, and I, I could, I, He said, I like, the more. natto plant was an example of something like that. Yeah, he, he likes the natto, and I haven't yeah. carefully examined it, but the general principles are, first of all, you want it to be the natural isomers. So, well, you don't want synthetic, and almost all of them are synthetic. And how do you know it's synthetic? It'll, you, there's, there's two isomers, a dec, but right and the left, a DNL, and the only isomer you want is a dextro, D. D. So, the D isomer, okay. if it says DL, you know it's synthetic, throw it away. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. And then it should, shouldn't say acetate after it because that's another synthetic. So d alpha tocopherol acetate, classic. Hmm. You know, we go into almost any drugstore, that's what it'll have. You just do not want that. Are there certain dietary sources more readily available than a not? Yeah, this, this, this is a this is great, great question. I mean, the best dietary sources are seed nuts. <laughs> you know, it's like the nature kind of put it in there. Yeah. You know, so it's really hard to get it. You almost have to take a supplement. And you don't need a supplement for it the rest of your life. Once your sea levels oils are down, like your LA, like both of us, mm -hmm. you may not need vitamin E at all. And just the stuff you're gonna get in normal foods is fine. Okay. But if if you have if you're like ninety nine point nine nine percent of the population, you're gonna really want it. I'm sure people are now wondering about your diet. And I mean, we just had what for breakfast, rice and oatmeal with some egg yolks and some berries. Three eggs. It's yeah. interesting because I feel like if I would have had breakfast with you like maybe five years ago, you were pretty low carbohydrate. Oh yeah. Doing a lot of animal a whole other so tell, tell me what's changed with your diet. Because that was a pretty good breakfast we had this morning. We didn't have water. Well, uh, it's sort of an extension of my appreciation, deep fundamental appreciation of the dangers of linoleic acid. I've been, I definitely want to go back to some of the other issues of cancer because there's, there's some stats that I'm going to share with you that are just mind blowing. But the, this deep appreciation of the dangers of linoleic acid, then I, then I started wondering, well, who understood this a long time ago? And it turns out Ray Pete, Ray Pete. was one of the main well, biologists the guys. Yeah, yeah. was warning about this 1980s. 1980s, and I had known of his work since about the 1980s, and absolutely discounted it because it was so bizarre, so weird. I thought he was a flaky, knucklehead biologist and didn't know what he was talking about. But then I said, if he knew about the lake acid, there's got to be this guy's got to have something up his sleeve. 
And he started looking at it and examining what he was talking about. And it, it blew my mind. And, and I greatly regret that I just understood his brilliance. Literally, he's an iconic classic legend in my view. Hmm. And understanding mitochondrial function, how to optimize it. And we, we would need three to four hours to go into that, so we don't have the time to do that. But but just take it for granted. And this is going to be part of the things in the course. Uh, is that just brilliant. He, he, he can help people understand how to optimize biological, biological function. And it's not with beta oxidation of fats in mitochondria. I was wrong. Totally okay. wrong. It, the, the ideal one is glucose. And the best source of food. The you best mean consuming food. adequate amounts of glucose. Well, glucose is a fuel. You can get it from different ways. Ideally, you want to get it when it's bound. The glucose is bound to fructose, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a disaccharide. Uh, as you can find, like honey and fruits. Things. Absolutely, yeah, honey and ripe okay. fruits, which yeah. is key. Uh, but anyway, that goes in and uh, optimizing that. So that I, that's how I became aware of this. And uh, interesting, I just give you a brief history. One, because I I, it, I integrated his his approach earlier this year. I was pretty healthy. I mean, you know, pretty healthy for the yeah. most part. So once I did it, I was having about 150 grams of carbs like you, but I upped it to about four to 500. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to be four to 500. You have to have a high level of activity. And you have to have, you can't have insulin resistance. If you do, it'll be a disaster. That's what I understand is part of the repeat approach is high energy flux. Yes. Meaning marrying adequate carbohydrate intake, even as high as what you're saying, you're working yourself up to that 400, 500 grams. With uh, with activities that would increase glucose transporters, uh, doing some walking or staying physically active or, or getting sunlight or, or engaging in lifestyle activities that would be the opposite of not eating many carbohydrates, being cold, hungry, and libidinous and slightly inactive. And low testosterone. Yeah, and low testosterone, which I had to deal with when I was following yeah. this well, most ketogenic diet. I most know. most everyone does. Yeah. It is is classic, and that's it's just. An, absolute perfect classic illustration of the fact of inadequate cellular energy to, to, to make the, the testosterone. The answer is not testosterone replacement. The answer is to fix the problem. So anyway, I did this. My I, I dropped 10 pounds in weight. My body fat went from 15% down to 12%. By, you tripled your carbs and you dropped yeah, that amount of weight. But, wow. and, and that was went from 15% to, to 12% done by the Inline, I think it's the inline body measurement, mm -hmm. the, yep. which I think is the best. In body, in body, that's yeah. what it is. In body, yeah. it's it's pr almost identical to DEXA with yeah. none of the radiation. Yeah. So if you if you want to really know what your body fat is, I would do the in body for sure. And that was so those went from fifteen. That was fifteen the year before, and then twelve yeah. shortly after that. My HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I couldn't get it down below zero point eight, which is still healthy. Yeah, but it's still good. One. marker of inflammation. For yeah. So. And I got it down to 0 0.18. Yeah. 0 0.18. My fasting blood sugar went down 10 points. 10 points. Wow. Wow. And Why do you think that is? Well, that's paradoxical that your blood glucose would have decreased when you tripled your carbohydrate intake. Because your blood sugar is not necessarily related to the amount of carbs you're eating. I mean, it is directly related, but it, it, it has to do with the metabolic health. Okay, you're going there. You're talking about the potential for a hypercortisolic response. To yeah, yeah, when you don't have enough cortisol. Causing yeah. a paradoxical rise in glycogenolysis and an increase in blood glucose because you're high cortisol due to lack of... Well, that's, that, 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 that's, that's what Georgia Dinko helped me understand, is that, yes, you know, there, there's not a, a, an excursion to glucose levels. You have a very steady glucose level when you're low carb, low carb, low carb but it does it because your body wants to stay alive. Mm -hmm. If you go into low blood sugar levels, you will die. You the same reason that food. someone who's even eating a low carbo diet would, would have extremely high blood glucose level after workout or after a sauna or after a cold plunge because there's a transient rise in glucose in response to stress. With yeah. those activities, you tend to see long term blood glucose stabilization because the impact of those activities. Well, the stabilization, stress. the stabilization is only right. due to the secretion of cortisol and other yeah. stress hormones like. Uh, yeah. uh, Glyc uh, not glycogen. Um, uh, but, but, but what I'm saying is consistent carbohydrate depletion would cause the body glucagon. to still need to yeah, yeah, glucagon would still need to cause an elevation in blood glucose due to the stress. But that elevation in blood glucose has to come from the liver and from muscle and eventually muscle fiber break. Well it's the other way around. It, it actually comes from the from the the liver is a processing. It, it's the uh, 
amino acids are sacrificially extracted from your muscles, mm -hmm. your yeah. bone, right. in these really important tissues, and they're shuttled to the liver in a process called gluconeogenesis to create blood sugar. What's your, what do you say to people who, who say, well, why not just increase dietary protein? So. That because you could, you could do that, but it's a very expensive way to do it. Uh, and there's some side effects because you create a lot of extra ammonia and that is really hard on your kidneys and many people are suffering with kidney challenges. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, there's the ideal amount of protein for my understanding, and you certainly have your insights on it, but it's about 0.7 grams per pound of body weight. Yeah. Zero, 0 0.55 is the minimum. Yeah. Above 0 0.8 grams per pound. Not grams yeah. Per kilogram, grams per pound. You tend to see a law of diminishing returns right. unless you're extremely right. high in the weight yeah. in the body yeah. yeah. but Some body builders will still build and assimilate at 1.2 grams per pound plus, but yeah. that's pretty rare. Yeah. That's a rare part of the population. And that, you know, there's a there's a downside yeah. to that. So 0.7, that, that's a that's a good approximation. So so based on that, I do want to get back to one lake acid and cancer, by the way, but I'm just curious what, what's a typical day of eating look like for you, besides the rice and goose eggs and the blueberries and the watermelon we have for breakfast this morning. Well, and the, the, the eggs, right. the egg yolks that we have uh, are from the chickens or the geese that I raise, and they're fed very special diets. What so geese? The geese? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're geese. I mean, why geese? Oh, uh, just well, we initially got them because we wanted them to eat the weeds. They, they, they eat okay. a lot less food yeah. than chickens because they mostly eat the grass. Is the egg profile similar as far as No, the egg profile is much more radically improved. It's, it really? typically, yeah. They, because they don't eat typical feed, they eat mostly, they're mostly vegetarian, so the, the, the result, their linoleic acid is much so lower. Omega it's, it's, lower omega-6, lower linoleic acid in their, yeah. uh, in their eggs. Some of the, this is why chickens and pigs are not really great foods to eat. They are ideally, but they're monogastric animals, they only have one stomach, and as a result, they're just like us, and, and the, any linoleic acid that they're given tends to accumulate in their tissues. So almost, I don't care if it's organic free range chickens or pigs, they're almost all given given the grains, which are loaded with linoleic acid. They're very, yeah. very high. You can pass your, pass your pork to which yeah. sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very unusual. I mean, there are some, you can, if you raise them yourself, you, you can avoid it, but it's well, a surprise a lot of people here. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, what I normally have, I'll typically, I, I, I love ripe fruit. I, it's probably the majority of my carbohydrates is ripe fruit. So I'll, I'll start the day with, it depends if I'm a, it's a rest day or it's a sauna day, so I'll do three, four, maybe even more, four pounds of cut watermelon, not the rind. And, and right is because more important to you than, say, the resistant starch that oh, you no, want no, no, from an unripe banana. And for you, it's because of that blend of glucose and fructose. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I do. Um, and I've, I've had some kidney damage as a result of mercury. You know, in proper and mercury extraction done 30 years ago. Hmm. So I, I challenged with this, so I cannot go high. I mine, I really rarely go over 105 grams of protein a day. Okay. So I, I so I have some lamb would be my primary meat, but I only have like three ounces of lamb, that's it. Yeah. It's a relatively small amount, but so my protein comes from other sources primarily. That's still, because what do you weigh approximately? Uh, 180. Okay, so you're, you're not too far below 0 0.7 grams per pound. Yeah. At 105 grams. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and because I'm a big believer of you, and I'm, you know, this is the first time you've been to my place, but I'm so impressed with your exercise routine. It's it, it's radically modified my things. We don't we don't have time to talk about it, but, but believe me, I will acknowledge you in the yeah. course because it's you're you're such a classic illustration of implementing what I believe is, and I've been passionate about exercise as you have been. Since 1968. Yeah, you were part of the big marathoning craze. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. So, and I had most of it wrong, and I'm gradually evolving and refining my progress, my, my my perception of that, and you radically helped in that area with respect to, because it's all about movement. It really is all about movement. You've got to nail in. You are not a muscle, a bodybuilding muscle head, which a lot of people like, because if you do excessive not resistance anymore. training, <laughs> yeah, if you do excessive resistance training, yeah. you will die prematurely. Yeah, you, you, it's great stuff, but it's, it's small doses. Not to rabbit the hole too much, but that's part of that J curve that James would yeah, yeah. Reverse J curve. Yeah, reverse yeah. J curve, meaning that not only do you reach a law of diminishing returns when you get to about 180 minutes of high to moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise, but the law of diminishing returns for what would be considered like intense heavy weightlifting is mm -hmm. even lower than that. 
Much lower. Yeah. yeah. Anything over an hour a week could be probably. Yeah. And I saw you work out today and maybe you did about five to 10 minutes, maybe even, not even that. I mean, well, would, and maybe zero because you yeah. really, I mean, you were working out, but you were working out that intensely. What I do is I'll do a few lifts, but then I do mobility. Yeah, it's do, almost I all really you know, Get up and get down off the ground, a little foam rolling. So even though I'm sometimes in the gym for an hour or two, I typically might reach 20 minutes or so of actual weight training during that time. When I'm at home, it's just that ARS. But feel like your weight feeling. training isn't that intense. It's not like you're pushing. No, it's not like you're heavy. Yeah. 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 You're not in the pain kit. I think it's better for the joints also. If I go heavy, it's not heavy. It's either blood flow restriction bands yeah. to trick the muscles and just thinking they're lifting a heavy weight or a moderate weight lifted super slow, which I think carries with it much, much more longevity in sport yeah, and lower I, risk. I, I, you, you really have a dialed in. I, I have great respect for what you've been able to, the knowledge and practical skill set you put together over your lifespan. So it's congratulations. Well, that's my right, I mean, that's my jam. That's my I know, I, I know. Strength conditioning, that's what my degree was in. Yeah. But so, um, so back to the, the diet, you've got things like the goose eggs, you have the rice, the oatmeal, the berries, the ripe fruit. What about like organ meats, meat, things like that? Oh yeah, yeah, organ, organ meat. You don't need much. I mean, maybe you know, ten grams of organ meat a day. You know, small amount. Um, and then I have raw milk uh, for sure, and I have a lot of I have a lot of white rice, basmati white rice, uh, because it's, it's white rice versus like sweet potatoes or yams or purple potatoes. Or you could use like potatoes. You have to be somewhat careful. I'm not. I don't. If I do, I, I have to. I'm not. I'm not about potato base, but I was having red potatoes, small red potatoes, not russet potatoes. Mm -hmm. But you have to be really careful and cook them incredibly well. I pressure cook mine uh, because there's a starch that can form, and, and we don't have the enzyme capacity to adjust those starches easily. So it passes through our small intestine into large intestine, forms this fuel for the, the bacteria in your colon. You mean if you're consuming tubers without doing some like pressure cooking? Yeah. yeah. Well, even, even I mean, I wouldn't know if I'd have any tuber other than rice, but they're, then put potatoes. And then, yeah. and then they have to consider the oxalate issue too. So, but, but if you're pressure cooking them, you're, you're the oxalates are water soluble, yeah. so they yeah, That's my understanding. Give rid the oxalates can decrease a lot of the lectin and get rid of any type yeah. of problematic starch by yeah. pressure cooking. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the best way to cook a tuber. Yeah, yeah. so you, you do that, and then then you the, you can actually your body can absorb the fuel rather than bacteria. The danger of bacteria doing it is that they they uh, the gram negative specifically they can reduce something called lipopolysaccharide. And LPS for short, which is another term for endotoxin, which you can yes. serotonin, which is a whole the rabbit hole we can go down. But bad news. So I wanted to switch back to the linoleic acid because it is, yeah. in my view, aside from sun exposure and, and movement, which are, I mean, it's hard to prioritize them. They're also, they're fundamentally foundational. Yeah, you don't have to prioritize yeah. them. Stack, not going to be yeah, stack. Yeah, yeah. Right. absolutely. Like every day I stack earthing and grounding, sunlight, some form of weight bearing, hot, cold water, minerals, yeah. and uh, some type of movement and mobility. And yeah. That's like a typical day for me. If I can check off those boxes, yeah, well, you're doing another one. You're work. doing another one, and you've done it for the last nine years, so you don't even recall it. But you're avoiding the lake acid. Yeah. So what? What are the? This is astonishing information, and I kind of knew of it, but I didn't compile it into a table until after I wrote my paper. But as I was preparing presentations, I said, "Oh my gosh, this is this is crazy." So the amount of obesity in the 1800s. Was about one percent. So per hundred thousand, he had a thousand people. One percent. Yeah, and that, that's not because obesity, obesity was less reported; it was no, less existed. It didn't exist. Okay. I mean, it, 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 but it still was there because not all obesity is 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 connected to linoleic acid. There's a, there's a lot of other things that can cause it. So because even in the nineteenth century, they had obesity. One percent. Mm -hmm. Today we have like. 40% on our way to 50%. And are you referring to America primarily? Well, industrialized countries in the West. Okay. Yeah. So, so we've got an increase from 1% to 40% of 40x in that time frame. Then you go to diabetes. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have that many diabetics. It was like, it was a lot less than a thousand. It was like, you know, type 2 diabetes, not type 1. 
uh, say type one is an autoimmune disease. Which and again, this was not necessarily because less knowledge of the condition existed. No, no, there no. were less diagnosed cases or there were underreported cases. Yeah. This is pretty ironclad that they they actually have less diabetes and have less obesity. Yeah, and and now you can make a strong argument. I mean you're not formal legally classified classified as diabetics, but either diabetes or pre diabetes, which I consider a fasting blood sugar, anything over three digits. Okay. You know, that's thirty percent of the country. Anything over three digits. Yeah, a hundred or more. Oh, okay. I got, I got what you're saying. Yeah, fasting. Okay. Anything over. You, you don't mean immediate post cranial glucose. No, no, no. I said fasting. I was okay. really clear. Fasting glucose. Okay. Fasting. Yeah. 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 Fasting. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there's, you know, there is no danger to have a blood sugar yeah. 130. But for reasons I just stated earlier, don't test it right after you exercise or you'll freak out and think your fasting glucose is way higher than it should be. Do it fasted yeah. and relax. Yeah. 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 For sure. So, so it's thirty percent, and it was like it was. It's gone up like fifty x. No, wait, not fifty x. I think it's five hundred x. I should have looked at the the table. Wait, what's gone five hundred? Diabetes. Okay. Yeah, and the treatment for diabetes is not glucose restriction. It isn't. Now you can control it with a low carb diet. That doesn't mean you're okay. curing it at all. You know what the fundamental reason for almost all diabetes is? I mean, I'm going to guess that you're going to say the illness of root of gas. It's a little leg acid. But explain that. Why is that? Because it ruins the ability in the mitochondria to, op, to, to allow glucose to be optimally metabolized. So if you can't metabolize it, then where is it going to go? It's going to be shuttled out into the, into the cytosol of the cell, and it's going to go into glycolysis. Yeah. And you're going to increase lactate, and it just messes things up. And, and, and it basically... That is the Warburg metabolism. Otto Warburg was a guy that got one PhD in oh, his. I'm seeing the cancer rates now. Keep going. Yeah, he's he is co his, he's commonly attributed that sugar is a fuel of cancer, and he never never said that. And that, that his work does not show that it isn't the fuel of cancer at all. I mean, it uses it, but it's it's the it's the distorted metabolism. Now, what is a Warburg effect? It's when your mitochondria is unable to burn glucose. Despite the fact that there's plenty of oxygen, and it goes into glycolysis. Now, when you and I put on the, the so normally, if your mitochondria had blood glucose and there was oxygen available, it would be able to metabolize that glucose to produce ATP. Right, and normally in a healthy, normal state. Yeah, and assuming you haven't overfed on glucose right. or you're not been sedentary for a long time. But if we were to sprint or put the katsu bands on and do some go to you know like the, really the, intense yeah, blood flow restriction right. bands. Right. Then you are creating an oxygen deficit. There isn't enough oxygen to burn glucose. So that is not the war breaker because you're going to create lactate, but that's what your body's designed to do. That is a rescue mechanism that's, that, that's healthy. Right. But, but if you're doing that when there's plenty of oxygen, you have a problem. That's cancer metabolism. Yeah. So that, that, so is that because the cancer will thrive, not necessarily in the presence of high glucose, but because it will thrive in an anaerobic, high acidic state? No, it's more fundamental than that. It's actually getting back to, to the creation of energy within the, within the mitochondria. So if it's shunted and you have to rely on beta oxidation, you're going to, you're, these, these processes are going to create ultimately more oxidative damage. They do that through, through a mechanism that we don't have time to discuss and virtually no one watching this understands. Is it does it through the creation of reductive stress. Okay. Which why mechanisms, I think me and I talked to this yesterday, some of the mechanisms of methane blue and ozone mm -hmm. are related to re reducing that reductive stress. Right. Yeah. So that's how they work. But uh, lenalate acid is the exact opposite. It causes reductive stress. And, and that's one of the reasons that mitochondria gets damaged and dies prematurely. You know, it, it's the, all about the mitochondria. Listen, if you're not a steel man, your argument, what's the number one argument against what you're saying regarding linoleic acid? Because surely you've gotten some pushback from this. <laughs> there really is no hard, hardcore. I, there, I mean, other than the delusional concepts, like it's in breast milk, so it must be healthy. You know, it's just, they just, it's just an, an ignorance of the basic science of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that is the fundamental component of Pete's work is low linoleic acid. It's many people who teach it, don't really, I mean, they mention it, all of them mention it, but they don't necessarily emphasize as much as I think they should. If you were to look at something like epidemiological data or- That's what I'm trying to do. Work in the blue zones or something like that. Yeah. If, 
you were to investigate those diets, would you find consistently lower amounts of linoleic acid, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and the study's been done. Chris Kenobi, who's a uh, ophthalmologist by training, uh, has essentially quit his practice and turned into an investigative journalist on this. And he's done a great review of the world literature in 25 countries he's examined and, and done, done gathered statistics and made the graphs and everything. And I, I've kind of compiled that and put it into something even simpler. So one of, one of the most astonishing uh, pieces of information data that I, I shared with you yesterday in our walk is that the incidence of heart disease in the United States was essentially unknown in the 19th century. The first reported heart attack in the United States was in 1912. 1912. Essentially, it was like a, maybe a handful of people had heart disease in the 19th century. So we go from that to the point that we have over a quarter million people today in the United States dying every year, dying from heart attacks. Mm -hmm. That is like millions of times increase. Can you attribute that to one specific factor, though? I mean, I mean so so there, economic there, status means oh, access to higher palatable oh, foods and a more sedentary lifestyle due to the advent of technology and possibly more stress. I and mean, there's got to be a cluster of factors that would result in that. I mean, surely you can't say all of it is related to living. No, clearly not all of it. There's no question. EMFs and everything too are also contributing. Uh, but in my view, I don't. There's no other explanation for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else can cause it? I do okay, know, so I do know when I went to, say, to India, yeah. because I had to be very careful in India, this was three years ago, I'd have to ask every time for the chef to come out and ask them to prepare my meal in olive oil or in ghee. Or mm -hmm. ghee with and the reason for that is prior to going to India, because I had to give a lot of talks about health, and I noted that the increase in chronic disease, particularly diabetes in India, did not correlate at all to an increase in average percentage of carbohydrate or sugar. Right, exactly. Diet. Was, was and instead, it skyrocketed as soon as vegetable oil was introduced as a substitute that's oil right. for the common oils that are used there. So I get what you're saying. Yeah, that's I think it's still multifactorial, but but I've seen some of the data on the increase in vegetable oil consumption and the direct rise of carbohydrate. That's disease. exactly what it is. And Chris, Chris Kenobi has really done an excellent job of documenting that. And now that I'm thinking about it, and you mentioned that probably the biggest argument against this would be the people saying that it's no, it's all the carbohydrates. Yeah. It's all the carbs. And, and if you go to certain countries, like really large countries, like country, like China, one of the biggest countries in the world, and the amount of sugar is actually decreased, yeah. decreased. And this was went up and the, and the disease went up just following it almost the maybe, maybe you're at least making some friends now with the corn and grain lobbyists. <laughs> and well, no, no, <laughs> corn and grain, are full of seeds. seeds. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. that's the primary source. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, 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 this is not my first book. Back back to why the geese that eat the plants are going to be healthier than the chickens or pigs. Right. Yeah, my first book in 2004, almost 20 years ago, was a no grain diet, which I, I wasn't thrilled with the the, head, the title of that book, but it, it actually is good, and I tend to agree with it. Except for the, the anomaly would be things like white rice, not brown rice, because brown rice has a lot of the linoleic acid in the, in the, in the whole. Uh, and, and you could do oatmeal if you're careful, but you know, gluten is not your friend and most of them are sprayed with glyphosate. So you've got to be careful. I mean, I don't think it, virtually anyone should be eating wheat. Yeah. You briefly mentioned EMF. Yeah. yeah. I was saying really that there might be a correlation because I'm just thinking here about the radiative effect of sunlight and the, mm -hmm. the, the consequences of high linoleic acid consumption and sunlight exposure. It drives me nuts when I walk through the average like mm -hmm. water resort and everybody's sitting around eating french fries and chicken wings. I'm like, gosh, this is, this is the worst time to be doing that. Uh, preferably do it indoors out of the sun. But when it comes to EMF or you know, electromagnetic radiation or non-native EMF, dirty electricity, etc., would you have an increased susceptibility to the damages of that if you have high linoleic acid consumption? Well, there's no study that shows that, but it, uh, George Dinka, who's a mentor of mine, uh, has explained really clearly previously that people who have low linoleic acid di diets have much less risk of dying from exposure to high doses of ionizing radiation, hmm. like from a nuclear blast. But but like an EMF, like a Wi-Fi router, that's not ionizing radiation. It's not ionizing, but they're yeah. real similar. Okay. In fact, so what happens, what, what we believe the mechanism for damage from EMFs is because it 
catalyzes the release of calcium inside the cell because the levels of calcium outside the cell are 50,000 times higher, 50,000 times higher. So when it goes into the cell, it's a powerful signaling molecule. What does a signal cell do? It tells cells what some of the things are. It increases the uh, release of superoxide and also nitric oxide. And those are two molecules that they get even close to each other. They instantaneously, I mean, instantaneously form some, this reactive nitrogen species called a pair oxynitrite. And that is really, really damaging, probably collectively more, far more damaging than hydroxyl free radical. This hydroxyl radical only lasts about a billionth of a second. Hmm. This pair oxynitrite lasts a thousand times longer, so long that it can actually migrate outside of the mitochondria, outside of that cell, and go into another cell in the mitochondria and wow. hang around that long. So as a result, the longer it is, it stays around, it hangs around it because it's, it's almost as damaging as hydroxyl. But hydroxyl is more damaging, but it lasts a thousand times longer. Yeah. So anyway, so it's a calcium influx into the cell. So how would linoleic acid cause an increase in that already present calcium influx into the cell? Well, that's how EMF, we think, does it. And there's okay. pretty strong evidence for that. It turns out that linoleic acid has the same molecular action. That's what oh, it causes. Really? It causes calcium to go into the cells. Not only does it create the oxalates, it causes, and I didn't put this in my paper either, but because I didn't didn't make the dot, didn't connect the dots, and our life is busy, you just forget to, to do something. This is an important component, is that, it, that that's another way that linoleic acid contributes to increasing cancer, mm -hmm. is that through this calcium calcium influx. But the other thing that's almost in many ways very similar because it has a, I think the same number of double bonds is estrogen. Estrogen is not your friend. It is not a postmenopausal woman's friend. This is a dangerous, dangerous molecule. You mean excess estrogen? No, I mean, yeah, no, you do. It's, you, there, there's almost virtually no indication you can take an estrogen supplement. Right, but if your body is naturally producing no, some estrogen. Yeah, yeah, you, you, need you need some. You need some. Yeah, yeah. And why is that? It's because it's this calcium influx is one, but it's one of the primary contributors for cancer. Hmm. No question. Excess estrogen. And not, not only do we get it from supplements and Miss well intentioned but misinformed physicians prescribing yeah. it, <laughs> but but we get it from xenoestrogen here. Yeah, xenoestrogen, yeah. xenoestrogen, yeah. phytoestrogen. How much of it is the excess estrogen versus the progesterone to estrogen balance, like low levels of progesterone? Well, that's a big part of it. It's, you're unquestionable. Now, we, we talked earlier about that the major danger of low carbs is because your body to release cortisol and cortisol just shreds your muscle protein. Well, guess what? One of the most effective cortisol blockers are. Uh, the most effective progesterone. Yeah. progesterone. Yeah. 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 It just annihilates. It's kind of funny. Even a lot of guys, and there's an entire book written about this. I forget the doctor who wrote a book about anxiety. He can use progesterone sometimes trans only in children who have ADD and ADHD. But Dr. Chris Shea, actually, who turned me on to this that day, he said, hey, stressed out at the end of the day, a little anxious, you know, having trouble turning the brain off. Just put a little progesterone, like on the inside of the forearm, and almost immediately feel this drop in anxiety. Yeah, you, you could, but you, typically, we're looking for longer-term solutions so that you have to be really careful about it, because that will work short-term, but long-term, it's not a good idea. You want to, it has to be absorbed or connected with a long-chain fat. Okay. To get absorbed. Because if you just swallow progesterone pill, which you can't really do, you can buy pregnenolone powder, you can buy yeah. DHA powder, yeah. but you can't buy progesterone powder. I've just always recommended 3% transdermal progesterone. Cream. I don't think it's a good idea long term. Uh, because the, 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 I used because I did that. The guy who recommended that initially was John Lee. Yeah. Who passed away in yeah. seven John Lee and then Dr. Michael, somebody wrote the anxiety book, and he's another guy. Yeah, right. but. Yeah, it should be in a long chain fat and ideally administered orally, or you could do it. Subtransmucosally through a suppository or either vaginal or rectal. Uh, but there are, there, I can give you the link to a company that I really like that I think would does a really good job of it. And uh, oral progesterone. Oral progesterone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you got, you know, I wouldn't do transdermal. I would, I mean, it's okay for a while, but what I neglected to mention is that when I was using it in my practice, it worked almost for everyone in the first few months, but then, you know, three, six months, it started, you felt this tolerance, the tactical okay. access to it. Yeah, I've heard there's a little bit of a tactical lactic yeah. response, yeah. especially the transdermal. Let's say, uh, and again, like I would use it very infrequently. Just yeah, yeah, for yeah. something with one year after this one. Yeah, but for a woman, it yeah. reads it. In, and I would make a strong argument for many men, especially the low yeah. carbers, that that, that that progesterone could be a real, Benefit to them to increasing their testosterone level. Yeah, and I'm because pretty chill as this. You saw me on the intermittent hypoxic yesterday. Oh my gosh! You, you, you impressed the, you impressed, 
Yeah. Yeah. I know that's kind of kind of geeked out exercise stuff for people, but tell people about that intermittent hypoxic. Just just briefly explain what that is. Well, um, we have a device that can generate, it's a medical grade device. So it produces really pure, clean oxygen. The oxygen level in the air that we breathe is about 20%. This device can dial that back down to, to as low as 9%, which is kind of dangerous. But it has, it's also attached to a pulse oximeter, a medical grade pulse oximeter, not the one you buy for $25. It's kind of, it costs like 20 times that. And it accurately measures your PO2 levels. So it can monitor to see what your blood oxygen concentration is. And if you can get it down to the low 80s and keep it there, that's a really powerful stimulus to produce. Not all the time. No, no, no. I mean, short term. Short term, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, with this device, you, it essentially gives you pulses of, in our case, it's about 15% oxygen concentration, which is not much different than room air, which is 20%. Yes. But then you do that for seven minutes, or you can change the time, but... But essentially, you know, five to seven minutes, maybe 10. And then you go for two minutes, you pop into hyperoxia where you get oxygen concentration like 30, room air or higher, like 34%, yeah. like we got. And then, you know, it just generates all these intriguing hormonal and metabolic benefits. Uh, and especially if you're doing it with a, a mask on and because you're, yeah. you're getting this administered through an oxygen mask. And you're just sitting in a chair, yeah. even though you told me beforehand, you're like, this is going to feel like Wim Hof breath work. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. So I sat there for the first 10 minutes or so, didn't notice a lot. And then gradually my fingers began to tingle. I feel that slight oxygen hunger when it dropped. And then you get that rush of oxygen when it comes back in, just like you're doing breath work. Mm -hmm. This machine is doing it all kind of yeah. for you because I was laid back on an eye mask and in like a new call and in this deep meditative state would almost get trance-like every time it dropped the oxygen. And it's called, the actual title for this would be IHT, right? Intermittent Hypoxia Training. Training. Right. And this unit that you use, are you able to share the, the brand? Yeah, I'm currently using a cell gym. It's cell it's, gym. Yeah. Okay. It's, just, it's probably has a different name now because of the process of changing things. So it's mostly designed for commercials because it's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's a powerful thing. But you can... Hopefully, they'll come up with home units at some point in the future. But you can, you know, to get that benefit, but you can get similar benefits. You're not going to get the IHT benefits, but just the new calm app by itself. Yeah. Which we like. It's kind of pricey. I mean, just meditate. For meditation, yeah, especially with some good set of earbuds. Yeah. Uh, but if you do use the new calm, you only want, there's only one channel that works, and that's, that works. I mean, two. You like the nap one, too, but the rest you The rest of the channel. channel. The yeah. rescue channel. Yeah. And all, all the apps are good. I, I have a whole podcast about the new column. I'll link to in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Greenfield Life.com slash McCola, yeah. the number three, M E R C O L A, the number three. The new column is an app that has these trance like sounds that mm -hmm. are unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah, they're like three gigabytes by five. You're right. If you're going to use anything, go to the rescue tracks and like the, the 50, the 70, or the 120 minute rescue tracks. Are yeah. yeah. I, my favorites are the 100 and then the 50. Yeah. And I, I, it's something I do every day with pretty much every day. Uh, I would say five to six times a week. Either the cell gym or the new column. Both. Why both? Yeah. Both, both, yeah. yeah. both together, you know, the gravity chair you have set up. I mean, that's, that's a game changer. Yeah. Well, I was telling you, Dr. John Laurent, shout out to our friend John. He has this thing called the shift wave chair in his mm -hmm. office, which vibrates as you breathe in and breathe out in timing correlation to your breathing. That would be pretty amazing to, to yeah, 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 for sure. that too. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't gotten on this chair for thinking about it. Um, you, you know, one thing that I uh, I thought of as you were describing the deleterious impact of the combination of linoleic acid and EMF is ever since talking to you about your first book on the podcast, EMF, and I still think people should go back and listen to that episode. I started anytime on an airplane or in like an Airbnb with a ton of different Wi-Fi signals coming in or pretty much anywhere besides my house, which like yours is the hardwired ethernet and the low EMF and you know, all the dirty electricity mitigation filters in it. Uh, I take a, uh, magnesium, I take NAD and I take hydrogen. Those are my top three that I'll take when I'm in a high EMF environment because the magnesium seems to offset some of the calcium influx and the yeah. hydrogen and the NAD are selected antioxidants. I, I could, well, and it, I think D is really an antioxidant. All right. Well, well the, the NAD would be more for, for kind of like the DNA repair or protection. Yeah. So I would modify that somewhat now because uh, I think 
exogenous ketones are really useful. I'm not a big fan of people going into ketosis themselves because the process of going into ketosis is stress response. You mean well, ketosis without the use of exogenous ketones and fasting or starving or something? Yes. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. Inter or um, time restricted eating, intermittent fasting. So you don't really want to create ketones yourself initially, especially if you're metabolically healthy. But you can take exogenous ones, and, and yeah. like Frank, uh, Frank Loza. 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 Yeah. yeah, that was. I mean, those, those would be classic examples. They can really help. And you know, you ketone know, aid. Ketone aid, right? Yeah. And uh, so that can be really useful if if you're getting exogenous. That with respect to the NAD precursor. NAD, I mean, you, you don't want to take NAD yourself. It's very expensive and it's, and it's unnecessary. But I think the ideal one, this is one of the, my, my key points, is, is niacinamide by mm -hmm. itself. It's simple, inexpensive. You can get like a year supply for $10. Different than niacin, niacinamide? Totally different. Well, they're both called vitamin B3. Niacin is the one that will cause you flush. Niacinamide, NAD, what is that? It search for nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide. Mm -hmm. And nicotinamide is another term for niacinamide. It's not niacin adenine, it's not niacinamide adenine dinucleotide. Oh, interesting. The, the actual molecule of NAD is composed of niacinamide, not niacin. Yes, okay. you can convert niacin to niacinamide, but that's another, it's not as efficient. So you can just supplement niacinamide and get a similar effect? Like 50 milligrams, 50 mm -hmm. milligrams. You don't want to take 500. More is not better. There's a Goldilocks dose. Yeah. Yeah. It, I actually just tweeted about that, especially in someone with poor methyl donors or yeah, yeah. an MTHFR right. deficit or uh, high state of inflammation, high amounts of NAD can actually be harmful in a situation like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, I, I, I pretty much take niacinamide regularly. I think that's one of the core things. I mean, vitamin E, most people need niacinamide at a small level, you know, two or three times a day, 50 milligrams. And that, that is the best precursor. And what you all the lifestyle effects, like circadian rhythm, yeah. optimization, exercise, because you know, NAMPT is the rate limiting enzyme, but yeah. you have to have the fuel to, you know, once you've activated NAMPT yeah. to, to make it. Even infrared sauna, fermented foods, there's a few different things that will increase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's yeah. really good stuff. All right. There's a video floating around of you out there, and I want to hunt it down and put it in the show notes of you crushing in a young, virile man in an arm wrestling competition. Yes, indeed. Is that video out there? Yes. Find it in the show notes? Absolutely. Okay. Sure. I get All right. So there's no note, note to my editor. Hunt it down. Put it in the show notes. Dr. Joe Mercola, arm wrestling. Uh, Dr. D from Miami. What's your secret? How'd you get how'd you get strong enough to, to beat a young buck in arm wrestling? Well, uh, this this I hadn't been embracing Pete's work for about six months at that time. So my uh, mitochondria. Ray Pete? Ray Pete, okay. yeah. Okay. My my mitochondria were too. I mean I'm not only metabolically flexible, but my, that my I had ultimate fuel in my mitochondria, glucose, yeah. was being, being subject. But, but an additional thing I was doing was the katsu, the blood flow restriction training that I've been doing for about six years. And that what that does is it activates type 2 fibers, yeah. specifically the, the endurance fibers that you get from high intensity and stuff. And you can tell if you watch the video that he kind of, it was exactly what you expect. His, his type 1 fibers failed. Exactly. In about very 20, 30 competition. Like he, he had the initial yeah, he was push on you, but as soon as his fast switch muscle pooped out, you could see that you just kept recruiting, well, was this, recruiting and recruiting. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and my fast switch fibers were much better trained. Yeah. Much better. Because was, that's what Katsu does. Yeah. And so I just... It's, Not to mention lactate buffering. Yeah. That's right. Lactate yeah. buffering. Yeah. yeah. That's an impressive video. I'm yeah, to show notes. I surprised a lot of people. It was that was it was really my achievement, my fitness achievement for this year. I mean, I've yeah. done a four hundred pound deadlift before, six hundred fifty pound leg press, uh, but I, I'm most pleased with that. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. We've only scratched the surface of your body of knowledge, but you've alluded to this master class a couple of times. Yeah. So how soon can people expect that to be up? I, I'm hoping by the end of the year. And oh, it's okay. going to be really, really yeah. inexpensive. It's we're, like we're recording in September of two thousand three. Yeah, it's like three, right? it's, 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 we're targeting like five dollars a month. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I want this to be available to everyone. Yeah, yeah, and it's the the purpose is to pre pre prepare people for what's coming with the because yeah. I've been doing this for fifty years. And I've compiled a lot of knowledge, and you know, it gets confusing because there's some of this, some of that. Really, well, 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 I feel it's my personal responsibility to put it all together, make it clear as can be. Yeah. You know, it takes me like ten to twenty hours to make one of these modules. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm really excited about it. It consumes almost all my time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love to learn from you, man. I mean, a lot of people ask me who my mentors are, and I can't say that I that I have a specific person who I talk to on the phone or anything like that. But you've definitely influenced me a lot, so I'm super grateful for you and, and grateful to be able. Well, to thanks. Know you know, you're down for a three P. 
Three Pete with Ray Pete. <laughs> All right, well, folks, again, the, the show notes are going to be at Ben Greenfield Live slash Mercola 3, including the arm wrestling video if you want to see that. If his master class is out, I'll stick it in there as well if that's out by now. And if not, I'll, I'll put it oh, in, in retro later on. And um, thank you so much, Joe, for doing this. Thank you to everybody for listening in. Until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Joe Mercola, signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. More than ever these days, people like you and me need a fresh, entertaining, well-informed, and often outside-the-box approach to discovering the health and happiness and hope that we all crave. So I hope I've been able to do that for you on this episode today. And if you liked it, or if you love what I'm up to, then please leave me a review on your preferred podcast listening channel, wherever that might be, and just find the Ben Greenfield Life episode. Say something nice. Thanks so much. It means a lot. In compliance with the FTC guidelines, please assume the following about links and posts on this site. Most of the links going to products are often affiliate links, of which I receive a small commission from sales of certain items. But the price is the same for you, and sometimes I even get to share a unique and somewhat significant discount with you. In some cases, I might also be an investor in a company I mention. I'm the founder, for example, of Keon LLC, the makers of Keon branded supplements and products, which I talk about quite a bit. Regardless of the relationship, if I post or talk about an affiliate link to a product, it is indeed something I personally use, support, and with full authenticity and transparency, recommend in good conscience. I personally vet each and every product that I talk about. My first priority is providing valuable information and resources to you that help you positively optimize your mind, body, and spirit. And I'll only ever link to products or resources, affiliate or otherwise, that fit within this purpose. So there's your fancy legal disclaimer.